Hey, 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. This is our 260th episode. It's such a huge deal. Thank you so, so much for listening here for so long. We really do appreciate it. And as we do every 10th episode, this is an audience-supplied Q&A session where we do our best to answer as many queries as possible throughout the duration of the show. Today, I will be doing the asking, and coaches Brian Miner and Brad Loomis will be doing the answering. We typically kind of rotate where these questions come from. Sometimes it's newsletter replies, sometimes it's from our YouTube comments, but today, All seven of our asks came from Instagram comments from our main team account, which you can follow at Team3DMJ. That's T-E-A-M-3-D-M-J on both of those platforms and on TikTok and on X or Twitter or whatever you prefer to call it these days. We're there too. So topics covered in today's episode will include how to know when your contest prep gets dangerous and requires medical assistance what type of RPE or RIR ranges we use when assigning programs for hypertrophy, whether we prefer to add carbs pre or post-workout for performance and recovery, how to feel or perceive a mind-muscle connection in exercises like an RDL, which food and nutrition tracking apps our coaches and athletes prefer to use, how to program high-fatigue, axially-loaded compound lifts depending on your training frequency, how to utilize high and low calorie days for athletes in and out of dieting phases, and a whole lot more in between all those little discussions. So as always, if you have any feedback or comments on this particular episode, let us know over on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team3dmj and leave it under podcast number 260. Let's get into it. Here is Q&A session 26 with Brian Miner and Brad Loomis. All right, first question. In deep prep, do you or your athletes ever experience symptoms of malnutrition or other medical conditions? Things like breathlessness, dizziness, et cetera. What are some of the rare times you've been concerned or sent someone to a medical doctor in contest prep? Brad, start us off. Um, I've never sent anybody to the emergency room. Let's at least get that out of the way. <laughs> That's right? good. Neither uh, one. That's good. Okay, good. So neither Brian nor I have had to send somebody to the emergency room. Uh, praise the good Lord. Uh, however, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've had to, you know, have people get at least like some blood work done, you know? Um, and sometimes we, I mean, let's face it, this is an extreme sport, right? We're doing things that the body doesn't necessarily want to do. And sometimes it's, it, it, it reveals things, you know, I've seen, you know, high creatinine, which usually is call it renal. It's not necessarily renal failure. Right. But sometimes Impairment, when you're taking that, maybe. exactly. Yeah. You know, absorbent amounts of protein. Sometimes people fall behind on their water intake and, you know, I've, I on more than one occasion had to get blood work done just because I was concerned about something being yeah. more invasive and causing more lethargy, lack of energy, et cetera, than in, is expected. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, yeah. Dizziness. I mean, we always see that when people's sodium levels drop and they're not getting a lot of food, they experience hypo tension, right? Especially the vagus legal response when they're tying their shoes and they stand up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, low blood sugar, you know, seen that quite a bit. Um, you know, it's got to be careful when someone's experienced hypotension and you say, okay, you need to start adding sodium to your, to your food. Well, then sometimes that causes a drop in blood sugar. <laughs> so you have to kind of give, be, be wary of those things and prepare the person for that. Um, but yeah, I think really that's probably the extent of what I've experienced, I would say. Okay. Right. Never had to spend somebody to urgent care or emergency room, but that's yeah, exciting. That's good. That's <laughs> yeah. good news. What about you, Brad? Huh? Huh? Yeah, I, I'm same boat as Brad. You know, I've I've had people. I think the most common complaint is is dizziness and lethargy, which you know can be hard to 
hard to determine, you know, without blood work sometimes, if that's just a result of the prep itself, it kind of comes with the territory type stuff. Um, which obviously none of that is ideal, but it's very right. common for, you know, blood pressure to drop, you know, a good bit during prep and sodium can help offset that a little bit. Um, the other ones I've had is, yeah, blood work for like testing to see if someone's anemic potentially. Mm. Um, but other than that, it, it's, yeah, nothing that's been an emergency. I think the yeah. other, you know, points where I guess I'm slightly concerned or at least more aware is, you know, when a female loses their menstrual cycle and when that's occurring within a prep and, you know, if, if it's a sign that, okay, maybe we've been running with low energy availability longer, you know, or more assertively than we should have, you know, out of the gate. And so keeping tabs on things like that, but, um, for the most part, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's trying to delay that as much as possible. And, you know, some of that is, is inevitable, but yeah, mitigating the risks more than anything, but no, no emergencies. That's good. No. Well, how, what would y'all say is like the frequency with which y'all have had to do something like request blood work? So like every season there's an athlete or like every three years or considering y'all are full-time coaches. So like, yeah, I mean, I'm not looking at their blood work and making judgment calls. That's a good thing to, them, yeah, which is listeners so, just so y'all know we're not so, medical doctors. I mean, I think for like, maybe once every couple of years there might be okay. somebody where if they're in prep where i'm like okay maybe you should get some blood work done right and see you know if there's something underlying here that can be addressed because you know as intake gets lower um you know micronutrient intake also drops you know mm -hmm. sometimes the habit people get into is you know playing macro tetris and <laughs> finding you know these processed foods to fit in because they're craving it and they it's almost like they accept the additional hunger from the lower volume of food um, just yeah. in the short term. But if, if there's people that do that habitually and that can lead to some deficiencies that can impact energy levels and things like that as well. Right. So that's why we, you know, we advocate for a primarily whole food diet and, you know, multiple servings of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, that that's low hanging fruit that I think a lot of there's plenty of people that aren't getting that right. Um, yeah. so that's usually the first thing I look at before advising them to go to a doctor is like, okay, yeah. are we, are, are we meeting the objectives of our plan in terms of nutrient intake? Right. Yeah. And, and, and ditto here, I, I would say maybe at most one a year. And even at that, it was when I was the busiest, you know, like I was actively coaching 20, 25 people in prep, you know? Um, yeah, I say that was the, the most frequency when my, my athlete roster was the highest and, you know, now it's significantly lower. And I don't think I'd had to do that to anybody last year, you know, because like Brian said, we can usually kind of troubleshoot things and figure out, okay, yeah, if you're dizzy, let's have you start, you know, kind of adding a little bit of salt to your food, making sure that you're not eating like a child and you know, eating cereal every day and protein bars and <laughs> getting your fruits and vegetables in and, and, you know, just whole foods, you know, kind of more so than anything. Yeah. And even when I was having to refer people for blood work or, you know, just to go get a physical or something like that, it was usually when those things did not get the result that I was after, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's, 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 it's rare. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always acute, right? Like it's not like, um, like you're off season athletes. This should not be happening, and it really doesn't. Yeah, it would just be yeah. wild. I mean, usually it's breath. more pronounced during prep for most right. people, but I mean, it's it happens. You know, in the off season, like I've had males that I work with where, you know, we have them get blood work done coming out of prep to see like how you know, if testosterone levels have started to normalize and things like that. But yeah, I think, yeah, only if there's symptoms that are presenting themselves, yeah. um, which occasionally they do in the off season, but for yeah. the most part, I, it does seem like it's in fat loss phases, extended fat loss phases right. where people are getting shredded. And ladies should get their period back. 
and and ladies things. should get their yeah. their their menstrual cycle back. Yes. Okay. All right. One and done. Number two. Regarding hypertrophy, is there an IRI? RIR you would aim for with compound lifts and is it different for accessories or would you always shoot for failure on all of your accessories so essentially I think the question is like reps and reserve aka RPE maybe y'all could explain that quickly if you wanted but is that the same for compounds versus isolations so what is do y'all think about RPE or RIR more as a coach individually how do you like to assess or assign? I mean, you, they're, they're essentially the same right. thing. But I mean, RIR, just reps in reserve, how many reps, proximity to failure, basically. Um, in practice, I think it depends on the compound lift. Like a lot of these questions are always, it depends. So, you know, kind of peeling back layers there. For, for muscle groups, or I should say movements that, especially if there's axial loading, which I know is another question later in this Q&A, but things that are just very demanding, you know, in terms of subjective effort, because, um, you know, leg extension at a zero RIR, it's going to feel easier than a squat to a zero RIR, just in terms of, if you want to say, like systemic fatigue. So, um, so oftentimes with those more demanding multi-joint movements like squats and deadlifts i'm I'm usually not well i'm really never pushing to failure on on those um you know maybe like the last side of a hack, hack last set of a hack squat or a leg press if you have somebody there to help but you know th those movements where you there's a large cardiovascular demand in terms of recovery i find pushing too close to failure can really it can kind of sabotage your downstream efforts pretty mm -hmm. considerably. And I think that's that's more of the, I think the implication and the downside of doing that is just there's this fatigue debt that maybe you might not make up and, you know, the total area under the curve in terms of stimulus for that exercise or that session may suffer as a result of like emptying the tank on a compound from the first set. But, um, you know, and as far as, accessories i mean usually you know if it's a machine it, i think it's it's usually safe to push pretty close to failure isolation movements usually pretty close to failure um and even the compounds i mean a few reps in the tank on a squat or a deadlift like that that's still a hard set like it's still a very difficult set so um that's my approach for some muscle groups like back uh, pulling movements Ber berto actually in his Latin triceps video made a good point about this where he he was talking about how for back work because the strength curve you know and the resistance profile is more biased towards you know the shortened positions I think a case can be made for pushing those a little bit closer to failure because you there's just less demand in those lengthened positions and so you get a little bit more stimulus by extending the set there maybe doing some lengthened partials after and even like yeah it's post failure um, techniques but things that are you know the loading is pretty lengthened biased i'm usually pretty careful with not to to overdo I, you know i don't avoid it but i try not to like not every set is to failure basically and you assign that in the spreadsheet like if it, and what um before we move on what would you a spreadsheet that had let's say we have squats and deads we have leg press hack squats within a full program and mm -hmm. isolations, what would your ranges for RPE or IRI be for each? Why so, can't I say RIR without? There were, I did it. Just say rear. Okay. <laughs> rear. <laughs> the rear. Um, yeah, but if the goal is hypertrophy, yes. any squat or hinge, I'm never really pushing past like two RIR for the most part, unless like it's maybe a leg RPH. press on the final set. So you usually what I'll do like in an intro week, I might say, you know, three to four RIR, okay. you know, maintain that set to set. And then maybe we top out at like two to three RIR, you know, in, in the next week. Um, but usually that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, for upper body compounds, it might be a little bit lower, but then once we get to things like leg extensions, 
you know, it's more like one to two or zero to one. I usually like to give a range just because I find people tend to obsess over a specific number when we're just trying to, we're trying to get in the realm of effectiveness right. here. We don't need to be perfect. Right. Anything to add? Yeah. And, and, and for me, yeah, ditto for, for what Brian said. Um, cause this specific question, he says, you know, compound lifts, well, compound lifts are not all equal. Like Brian mm -hmm. said, whenever yeah. there's axial loading involved, I mean, I never push to failure on a squat, even an RDL, you know, um, a bench press and overhead press, things like that. And, um, I, I mean, I, I, if it's a, a, a safe compound movement, like a pull down, you know, or a row or something like that. Yeah. You know, when you talked about your ranges, a lot of times on my spreadsheet, I'll give this range of kind of like first set versus last set RPE. You know, the first set, I want two reps in reserve, the second set somewhere in the middle, and then you can take the last one to the house and actually fail and neglect, you know, you're not able to get that bar or attachment that you're doing down below your chin, you know, but at the same time, you know, I challenge anybody to just get underneath the pendulum squat where it's safe. Like on my pendulum squat at the gym, I just bottom the thing out every single time. I just go all the way to the bottom. I pause, come back up, come all the way down so I can safely fail. Right. Even then I'm not going to prescribe it because I mean, I challenge anybody go out there on a pendulum squat that you can safely bottom out and push that sucker to failure until you cannot do another repetition. I can almost guarantee you, you're just going to feel like going home. You're not <laughs> going to feel like doing leg extensions. You're not going to feel like doing much for the rest of the day. And I don't prescribe that just for that reason. I mean, it's yeah. one set that you took to the house. And like Brian was saying, you just ruined the whole session when yeah. there's some good quality sets to be done there, you mm -hmm. know? So all compound movements are, are not equal there. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the isolation movements, if somebody's real gung ho, I'll let them take every last set of every exercise to the house. And then usually a couple of weeks later, they'll come back and they're like, okay, coach, I'm good. You were right. Let's leave a couple extra reps in reserve here and there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point. It's not like, uh, you're going to get hurt or any, I mean, generally you might actually, but it's more that you're for hypertrophy, you're chasing stimulus and volume and to feel something in your first exercise ruins your next four or five, then like why? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Personal question, just off of y'all's, what y'all said so far. It's interesting that, like you said, Brian, it's the same thing. RIR, RPs, like they're both intensity measurements or how close you are to failure, proximity to failure. But uh, Brian, you program in your sheets with RIR, and I think Brad, in your sheet, you program with RPE. Is it that... depends on who I'm working okay. with. Okay, I was going to say, like, so is it always I'll, that way? Because that's how it, you like conceptualize it? The power it lifters or... that I work with, I think everybody, it's just, it's like common law. You got to do RPE if you're doing <laughs> the big three. That's so funny. Okay. <laughs> but, but no, usually I, I find for most people, RIR tends to be a little bit more intuitive, mm -hmm. um, but I yeah, think... and 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 it's safe for me. It, it it depends on the person that I'm talking to because I tell people all the time that I speak the metric system, but I think in the imperial system. You know what I mean? So I have to kind of when I'm trying to figure out somebody's body weight, you know, and and, and kind of how that looks in my mind. I think in terms of the imperial system, like pounds, but I can speak the metric system in that I can kind of convert it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with RPE versus RIR. I'm always thinking in RPE, you know, at eight and a half is one rep in reserve for sure, maybe two. And, but I can convert that and I can speak in RIR in that, okay, an 8.5, that is in one RIR, you know, maybe 1.5 RIR, you know? So yeah. this, I think that's just the way I think, you know, I think RPE, but I can speak and translate and program RIR. Mm -hmm. And we have, I'm trying to look at it. We have a very recent, it'll be linked in the show notes, a recent podcast that was literally all about RPE and RIR. I know Brian was on it. Were you on it, Brad? I believe so. It sounds and familiar. Birdo. Yeah. No, Jeff. <laughs> I think, I Jeff was the other person. I think it was Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Do it'll you be even RPE there or something you go. like or that? Or do yeah. you need it? Yeah. So there's a yeah. whole, yeah. A whole pot so on that. I have one other thing to add that Let's I thought it. of here to this question. So, 
when we're, I think it's important that we're discussing hypertrophy here versus strength because, you know, with, with strength, it's how, how many reps in the tank do you have to get the weight from point A to point B? And so you'll see technical breakdown halfway through a set of squats, for example, where someone will, you know, I always use this, this as an example, but someone's hips will kick back. Like they're, they're unloading the quads to a large degree. They're reallocating the demands where with hypertrophy, the goal is to keep like hold your feet to the fire, really, you know, and, and keep the tension where you want it. And so things like a pendulum failing on a pendulum squat, like you will fail because of your quads. Like they will, you can't reallocate the demands at all. And so that, that subjective effort in some ways can be a little bit lower than it would be on like a squat, for example. So with a squat, like out of pendulum, I mean, I could be going and then just kind of hit a wall and be done. On a squat, it's like you kind of hit that wall, then you're like, okay, I can shift, reallocate things, and then knock out three or four more reps. And that's not really what we want for um, for hypertrophy. And right. and you know that you're going to accrue more unnecessary fatigue in doing that. So wh when you kind of look at it from like, okay, is this the movement RIR or the muscle target muscles RIR? There can be a little bit of a disparity there. And so sometimes what I find is pushing closer to failure when you're really focused on just the, the muscular RIR and you're just locked into your execution, it's not as, it's not as mentally daunting is like, okay, I'm just going to get the weight from point A to point B by, you know, any means necessary, like you might in powerlifting. So, um, Great yeah. Point. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. How so it's, like, like you're saying, I'm, I want to grow this specific muscle, this exercise, I am targeting this muscle, but if I keep going, a lot of homie muscles will come try to help out, but that's like not what you intended to do. You yeah. wanted this one. And so like, are my, it's almost is that like what you're pushing, saying? It's, right? it's almost in, uh, yes, the, okay. the homies, <laughs> the homie <laughs> like muscles. Like their buddies are coming in to help they're, out, they're, but you're like, that's homies, not yeah. what I was trying to do. For sure. That That's exactly what I'm saying. So yeah, with, with something like a squat, if you're like when you're hit, if you're keeping the intent to use your quads and you're not just like seeking the path of least resistance, if you're really trying to stay on your quads and you just can't help, but your hips start kicking back, like you've essentially reached task failure for your quads right. at that point, because the task is now changed because of it. Right. So it's, it's kind of like are you are you basing the RIR off of that, which I think we should, right. or are you essentially doing like a drop set? I mean, that's essentially what yeah. when you start when when the homies come in and start taking over, you're you're <laughs> you're contributing less to the group project, you know, and it's yeah. it's a, it's going to be a lower stimulus, but you've already reached failure essentially for that for the initial way you executed the movement. Right. And that's like a great case for form integrity beyond like it should look mm -hmm. pretty. It's like, yeah. no, because if your form changes, it's homie time instead yeah. of, like you said, um, what a... Yeah. Yeah. If okay. I'm hitting, if I'm doing squats and as soon as I start feeling my hips kick back, it's right. like a similar perception of effort is failing on a hack squat. But then I could, I could grind out three more, three, four more reps and be absolutely obliterated after that, but it's not really. It's it wasn't just more fatigue. quad. They just. It, they, it wasn't necessarily. They I mean, out. it was a little bit more quads. I mean, it was more quads because the set continued and they have to extend. But it's 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 a much lower stimulus at that point. Right. That makes sense. That was a great addition. Thanks, Brian. All right. Question three. With carbs, is it more important to fuel up with more before your workout or after? What would you think would be the ideal ratio breakdown between the two? We'll just take turns. I did the first one, you did the second yeah, one, now I'll good. do the third one. Perfect. Um, I would I would venture to say that it doesn't really matter much in terms of hypertrophy, uh, just because I remember vividly Eric's 
graphic that he put up a while back when carbs were most important. And it seems like the most important part was for performance reasons. And so to answer this question with that in mind, I would say you want to make sure you have enough carbohydrate to fuel yourself so that you can perform good in your training. Um, and then afterward, just whatever kind of I'm dieting right now. So I'm always thinking of a certain quota of calories and, and cal and carbohydrates that I can possibly, um, get in, in a day. So it's kind of like, I, I can only allow a certain percentage. I have to, I have to prioritize and focus on the amount of carbohydrate that I need to get through my session and to have a good session, make it effective, perform well. And then whatever I have left is going to be proportion to post-workout and throughout the rest of the day. Right. Um, so there's kind of important context there, but when it comes to like your non-dieting athlete, you know, get, get, get a good amount of carbohydrate in there that you can perform well with, uh, and then just get something in afterward. That would be my advice. And that's usually what I kind of follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, if I had to pick one or the other, it would be before a workout, um, now, granted, there's some, it depends with this question too, but usually, like Brad said, I, it doesn't matter much outside of performance, which can indirectly impact hypertrophy, obviously, but the, the case for carbs post-workout or what a lot of people assume is the reason for consuming a lot of carbs post-workout is for like glycogen resynthesis and replenishing what you burn through the session now like that that is like the more carbs you consume you know up to a point obviously the and depending on the type as well um you know you you're going to resynthesize glycogen faster with you know a higher carb intake typically now it, that's usually not necessary with resistance training because we're not maximally glycogen depleting anyway where it would probably make a bigger difference is like ultra endurance work, you know, or where there's different, you know, legs of a race and you're resting eight hours later going again, working those same muscle groups to, you know, depleted levels. And so the, the rate of glycogen resynthesis matters more for endurance work than it probably does for resistance training. But that being said, like we still want glycogen to get replenished. And so getting those carbs in is still important. But I think I, I just follow normal eating patterns, to be honest. I'll, I'll just have my lunch or my dinner after I, I, I train. And usually for me, things end up being pretty evenly distributed. If anything, it, it might be backloaded a little bit because my training is usually in the afternoon. So breakfast might be light. Now, if I trained right upon waking, maybe I would try to make sure I get ample carbs the night before in that last meal, especially if I'm not planning on eating before the session. But I think like on, on my, when I get this question, usually I tell people somewhere like 10 to 30% of wherever your average daily carb intake is. Like that's usually a reasonable amount to start with, but there's not going to be a direct number you know, across the board for everybody, you're going to have to see how you respond to it. Some people, if they consume too many carbs pre-workout, you know, they can actually kind of crash mid mid session. And so, um, you know, experiment with it, you know, start if you're dieting, you know, you can start on the conservative side, see how you perform, bring it up a little, see if there's any difference. If there's not, then you're probably okay with the lower amount and then you can allocate those carbs elsewhere. But I, I think, yeah, we want to prioritize performance and the pre-workout or carbs preceding the session are going to have more of an impact on that than the carbs immediately after. So when you say 10 to 30% of your daily carbs uh, before and after, you're saying as you're before, as you're pre Usually I meal. do before and after, you know, you, you give or take the a couple meal, hours, the give right? Or like it's give not... or take a couple hours. I mean, the, yeah. the meal before's Obviously, there's still a remaining percentage in the day, but I'm talking about the meal pre-workout and whatever yeah. the post-workout meal is. So yeah. for me, usually, you know, it's somewhere like 
I'd say on average, like 60 carbs, probably in, in both when I'm dieting. Yeah. Somewhere in that so, realm. Yeah. Great point. So it matters a lot more when you're dieting, when you're not far less. Yeah. Yeah. That It, it will matter significantly more when you're dieting, the timing yeah. of it all and the amounts. Because you're, you're not really glycogen walking around significantly glycogen depleted in right. the off season. So you're, you're going to see less of an impact there. Um, but yeah, as you get, as you get shredded and Brad, I know, you know, both of you have experienced this in, in prep, I'm sure it's like you, an apple can make all the difference. You know, when it comes and if you to have to stop to get gas, you're like, shit, yeah. the extra 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really yeah, matters. Well, do I think anything. that's a good point too. Like uh, y'all both touched on like time of day. So if you're working out in the afternoon or evening, if you've had plenty of carbs with all your meals, then like you're probably more, it, I would argue it matters a little less than if it was yeah, like, like you said, as soon matter. as you wake up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't put too much pay too much attention to it personally in my mm -hmm. own training just because like the net for most people their natural eating habits are going to kind of yeah. cover their bases in terms of how they spread things out so it's not a detail i would sweat but if your performance is suffering in a cut then it's probably worth experimenting with a bit and just see how you feel physically and mentally too you know if you Great point. feel groggy with too many carbs then you could try offsetting that with some fats, which is, you know, I, I think a lot of our programs, you know, are using calorie ranges and protein targets and leaving a good bit of autonomy with the breakdown between carbs and fats. And so a lot of that's preference. Mm -hmm. Most of it is. Yeah. And also we didn't even talk about, you could um, intro workout carbs, but I mean, I don't think, like if you're a power lifter, that's trying to make weight in the last few weeks, your sessions are far longer and more taxing yeah. than a hypertrophy sesh. Probably don't need it. But but like if you have a meal two, uh, two hours before your workout and you want to throw in an extra 20 grams of carbs like yeah. when you get to the gym, nothing's wrong with that. Like, no. No, and yeah. usually if, if people are training fasted, usually I'll try to get them to consume some type of sugar within the session like a gatorade mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be anything fancy yeah. um yeah that that can definitely help now the power lifters it's kind of funny because they, on paper it seems like they would have a bigger case for doing that because their sessions are so long and that's largely true but at the same time a lot of them are like so it's not really me. taxing like they're not really ripping through glycogen when they're training either so <laughs> but it point. can definitely yeah. help with just like subjective effort and um, you know, just keeping blood glucose at a reasonable level. Yeah. Hey, 3DMJers, just popping in with a quick announcement that we have just released our latest course in the 3DMJ vault titled Programs for the Platform. It's by one of our head powerlifting coaches, Brad Loomis, and it's literally exactly how it sounds. He wrote three powerlifting programs, all of which could be used as a competition prep or as mock meets or testing weeks that you strength athletes or hybrid athletes can use in whatever way you'd like. You'll get the downloadable and editable Google spreadsheets for each of the three programs, along with in-depth tutorial videos on how to use the sheets, what preferences or options you can select within the sheets, and how to utilize them for attempt selection on the big three at the end of each cycle. There's the Find Your Max program, the Big Four program, and the Big Six program, which vary a little bit in frequency and ability to add accessory work within them. But once you watch all the accompanying videos, it'll be pretty easy to select which one to start with or progress to depending on your situation, your schedule, and your goals. Programs for the Platform is now the 26th course in the 3DMJ Vault, which is our online learning platform of organized video-based education for serious lifters. You can get all access to all courses with a one-time purchase of a lifetime VIP membership or a one-time purchase of a single year VIP membership. Either way, as of 2024, this is not a recurring subscription any longer. You choose your single purchase option and you get to see everything in it for a year or for a lifetime. You'll get foundational courses like nutrition fundamentals for lifters, personalizing your program, calculating your calories, bodybuilding program design, calculating your macros, and the lifting library. You'll also get more specific accessory courses like 
the advanced deload guide, transitioning away from tracking, the godfather's guide to posing, the lagging body parts course, the physique photo guide, and more. So head on over to 3dmjvault.com and sign yourself up for a VIP membership today. That's 3dmjvault.com to get all access. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. All right, question four, is it imperative to feel the mind-muscle connection during RDLs? Sometimes I feel it and sometimes I don't. Am I doing something wrong? And should it be more in my glutes or hams or does that matter? So Brian, kick us off with like, how should in, how should you feel an RDL? You should feel a stretch, I'd say for sure. Um, okay. You're going to feel a stretch in your glutes and your hamstrings. Um, with an RDL, because you're dropping your hips back, there's going to be some knee flexion that goes with it. And so um, hamstrings aren't going to shorten as much as they would on an RDL as they would like a traditional stiff leg deadlift um, where there's, you know, not really any knee flexion going on or increasing across the movement. So like there's a slight bend, but it's not increasing as you go down. Um, so typically like an RDL, it's, it's a great movement for glutes and hamstrings. I think it's kind of splitting hairs between, okay, is this more hamstring biased or glute biased, um, for most people, but you should feel a stretch. Um, and really like the mind muscle connection as a whole, I think is, it's, it's certainly not useless, but it, the idea is overemphasized for sure. I think a lot of the, like you can get a great mind muscle connection, Usually I get better, a better mind muscle connection with movements that are like very short and biased things where like in the shortened position, when my muscle is contracted, there's high demands there. And I think a lot of that is just due to, you know, increasing metabolic stress, um, with those movements to a larger degree. And, you know, you just kind of feel that burn a little bit more with some of those movements than you would on something like a, you know, a bench press versus like a pec deck fly, you know, like a pec deck fly where it's more even resistance profile. Like you're, you're getting a good bit of tension in that contracted position and you're getting a little bit more buildup of metabolites and that burning sensation than you would on a bench. And so if, if we're relying too much on mind muscle connection or is that that's is the main proxy for you know effectiveness then i think it could be misleading for for some people and the other thing too is with with most movements you want to get to a point where you're putting yourselves in positions where the target musculature has no choice but to work and and so it's not like we can think our way out of efficiently moving in a in a certain position so an RDL, like typically, you know, at deep levels of hip flexion, your adductors are going to contribute most and at, you know, more shallow levels of hip flexion or angles of hip flexion, your glutes will take over a little bit more, get a little bit more of that relative, you know, output. Um, so it, it, it's, yeah, I, I, I would rather see somebody, as long as you're executing the movement properly, even if you're not feeling it as much as you do, you know, in some other movements, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you should feel a stretch for sure. Cause you're, you're lengthening the glutes and the adductors and to some degree, the hamstrings. Right. Brad. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add really, uh, except for, um, emphasizing Brian's um, properly, you know, doing the movement. Um, cause so, so many times people will take an RDL and they'll turn it into kind of like what looks like somewhat of a, of a quasi, uh, half kind of good morning ish half RDL with way too much knee, um, flexion involved. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I don't advise people just lock their knees out and do a, a straight leg deadlift because that's something that is, is, is a fair amount of technical ability, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes your the back of your knee and your PCL and those connective tissues, they might not be able to handle that kind of stretch under load, right? That loaded stretch. But 
if you can maybe start out with a straighter leg version, focus on your hips doing the work, moving back and then moving forward to get back underneath the bar. Um, I feel like you're going to, to do the exercise the way it was intended to, and, and mm-hmm. to use Brian's term properly, you know, cause you don't want, you don't want your knees to travel forward. You don't want to use too much knee flexion. It's intended to be a glute hamstring dominant movement. So you want to kind of like focus on your hips and the hips going back posteriorly and then forward anteriorly. Mm-hmm. And the knees should just be an afterthought. And if you Mm -hmm. do that, I feel like that should get everything in line to kind of fall into place. I like, I like that the knees is an afterthought because I think sometimes people will, yeah, consciously try to apparatus lower. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Or exactly. So they'll, they'll, they'll try to, uh, do that or yeah, think they're, they're not leading with their hips. Now, obviously knees. Like there, there's going to be some knee flexion because your hips wouldn't travel horizontally if there wasn't, you know. And so that that there's going to be some, but like Brad, at said, least not without you falling over backwards. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, like Brad said though, if you lead with your hips, like the knees are like that's going to take care of itself. And one of the cues I really like with RDLs is is just keeping shoulders over your feet. And so Mm. you're not like hinging forward and you're hinging Mm -hmm. back. Another cue that I've used before is like shutting the car door with your butt. Like if you have groceries in your hands, you know, just kind of pushing it back. Yeah. Um, I think Brian, if he's listening, Brian Borstein, I think told me that one once. Um, But uh, yeah, with with RDLs, I think the other thing that sometimes people get wrong is they assume more range of motion mm-hmm. of the bar is better, and we're trying to stay. I was guilty the act- of that. Yeah, I was too. I was trying to, you know, we want to stay in the active range. We want to maximize the range within the joint, the active range of the joint. So, how we do that in an RDL, and this usually results in a shorter range of motion than I think people realize, is. Mm-hmm. As soon as your butt stops moving back, you're then, done. And then you're done. And usually, you know, the bar might be just below your knee. You know, it might the plates might, you know, be far from the ground, and and that's okay. Like that's what your yeah. mobility and your joint structure allows. Um, but usually, what happens sometimes people say like, okay, I don't feel it in my glutes. I feel it in my back. And oftentimes, that's because. They're trying to maximize that range of motion in order to gain any more range of the bar. They're getting back flexion. I also feel it's, like this lack of scapular, retra- like, um, like some people will reach by yeah protracting and mm-hmm. then their back hurts. Yeah, I just feel like that's a- yeah, and even their low back too. Like if you're mm-hmm. trying to if you if you max out an RDL like in terms of hips, back, and then you try to keep going lower, if you, either you're going to need to bend your knees to get down there, which we don't really want. Or you're gonna have to round your back back a yeah. tiny bit, yeah. And that's what that's yeah. when you're gonna start like, okay, now my back is pumped, and obviously yeah. it's gonna work your spinal erectors too. It's not it like it's isolated to glutes and hamstrings, but we we want to keep, you know, try try to stay as neutral as we can. I would say and stop once your hips stop going backwards. I think um, there's also a case for if it's like having issues feeling it correctly in the right places with a barbell, uh, switching to dumbbells or a hex bar, right? That yeah. Can help a lot. I would, I would agree with that. A hex bar I really like, um, yeah. cause it's kind of the, can load it a little bit heavier. Like it's, it's not as cumbersome as dumbbells sometimes, you know, having to walk those back. Um, yeah. So I like that. And for some reason too, a, a good morning, it's essentially an RDL with the bar, the bar on back. top. Yeah. And some people, really struggle with good mornings it, feeling it and i actually i f- i find it's a more natural way to hinge for me and i i'm still trying to figure out why <laughs> but <laughs> because they 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 i i think it's just easier for me maybe as a low bar squatter i was gonna say if you're a low bar back it, squatter, it's I probably like i'm comfy. sort of used to kind of breaking at the hips um yeah but 
like if I only had to pick one, I probably would pick an RDL just because there's, you know, you're getting some stretch on the traps and upper back as well. Last thing on this, would have you ever, if someone tends to go out of position with their heavy RDLs, do y'all ever switch to like a single leg dumbbell if they have the time or y'all don't usually? So I, I have before. Okay. Um, usually the, the single leg hinge work, sometimes, uh, oftentimes the people that are doing that are doing it for a reason for like rehab for something and or mm. correcting an imbalance that they have. Um, so unless they have that, like, I, it can be a good way to like really teach them like how to work each side independently. Like for me, I know like my right glutes probably stronger than my left. And so it probably would benefit me from doing some unilateral work in terms of hinge hinging, but and then would it become it, an accessory in your terms of programming rather than like? I still consider an RDL like a an accessory. Okay. I mean, I think some of those so those terms are kind of yeah. Subjective. As soon as I said it, I'm not so my brain went yeah, like, well, well, well it's I not mean, that for, it changes. For, it would just be the, where it's programmed. Yeah, I mean, and I, due I to would this still lack probably of fatigue compared potentially. To a heavy I mean, barbell. a single leg could be very demanding too. True. You know, yeah. So. I would usually, if I did that, I pro I would probably start it in the same spot and then just mm -hmm. have them do that. And then if they, um, like they're still going to be getting a similar stimulus, you yeah. know, so it's, yeah. if it helps them target the musculature better then then yeah, but I, d I don't like to use unilateral work just because usually it's, there's a specific reason for it. And like you said, sometimes it's for technique. Interesting. All right. Brad, anything to add? Uh, no, no, not really. Um, I was trying to think of, of the, um, the unilateral work examples where I have done that before. Um, I just don't have very good luck with it because it seems like with unilateral RDLs, um, yeah, I just haven't had very much luck with it. People can just work over their way around it, you know, cause it's hard to load and, and their it's hard hips to keep kinda, your balance. Too. Exactly, it's like it, it limits your output quite a bit. Yeah, and you can just you sometimes you can just feel like you can do them forever because either a you do lose your balance and you quit early, and then by the time that you get your balance back again, now you've recovered enough that all of any fatigue that yeah. was there is gone. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's so. so funny. That's like my bias coming in that like a contralateral unilateral RDL is like butter to me. Mm -hmm. or I don't do it anymore. But like when I was bodybuilding, like especially my first few years, like I loved that movement. But um, I, I don't know if naturally, like how we were talking about earlier, how I would know, though, whenever uh, my full body is tired versus like my glutes working, like we talked about with the other question. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, when it's like your ass is done, so stop doing it, even though you can row it up or whatever. And keep moving yeah. 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 from point A to point yeah. B. Yeah. 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 Um, and I also just want to point out how that's not like it's everything, because I know y'all have talked many times about how... It's not that you don't program unilateral work at all. It's just funny how on this movement, y'all are like, I don't really like it. But I think like a podcast or two ago, we talked about how much how much more effective it will be for lat training because you can cross the body, mm -hmm. you know? So I Yeah, just, and that, well, that would be a valid reason, I yeah. think. Um, I do it a lot with lats. Yeah. And I'll do split squats too. Um, oh, yeah. Well, But the, the unilateral RDLs, I think one of the... I'm, I'm not a huge fan, kind of like Brad said. Mm -hmm. Part of it's my own personal bias because I've never been great at them, I'm sure. But the the other thing too is I think a lot of people struggle with stability on those, right. um, like to really get a lot of output unless they've really ingrained that movement like it sounds like you did. I, it wasn't even like, I don't talk about it. It's, I don't know. why. It's just funny. I have like these old videos. I'm like, why would I have gone there? I don't know. I'm sure it was like a it's probably, ladies glute program back. It's probably there. like that supple leopard book. <laughs> 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 after a 30 minute banded assisted yeah, after, flossing yeah, after yeah after violently smashing a lacrosse ball against my glute <laughs> for 30 minutes uh i thought i was so right though okay we did it we did it on to question five what food app do you guys recommend for tracking in terms of nutrient accuracy and whatnot um or just in general i guess something that might be useful to listeners is like what do you guys have on your phones? Unless you use paper, which would be wild, but I'd love to hear. And then what do your athletes prefer most that you've seen? 
Yeah. Um, my athletes love macro factor. They absolutely okay. love it. And I don't, I've never even seen macro factor to be honest with you. Um, however, I will say of all of the tracking, cause all those tracking apps, they kind of like gauge your expenditure and they kind of give you some sort of a comparison as far as what you ate versus expenditure and, and mm. had they give you, you know, my fitness pal was famous for that. These are how many calories you can eat, you know, to match your expenditure, you know, and things like that. They all suck except for macro factor. I mean, they all way overestimate, they way overestimate what your expenditure is. But with macro factor, I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I like to do things by hand. I like to compare, okay, this is what your body weight's done over the last four weeks. This has been your average intake. And then I'll calculate it all from there. And time and time again, I've used my methods and good old fashioned arithmetic, calculated things myself, said, this is what you should take in to lose a pound or a half a pound or whatever our target weight loss is per week. They'll plug that into macro factor and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I've even in one or two cases, just basically coached people say, okay, we need to pick it up here a little bit, turn macro factor up to, you know, losing a pound a week and or pound, no pound and a half a week. And oh. I'll be damned if it doesn't <laughs> end up four weeks later, they lost four pounds or they lost six pounds, you know, or whatever it was that we were targeting. Um, that's what my athletes love. That's what my athletes love. I will say that at least so far, I'm mildly impressed uh, with how it works. Okay. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I was a my fitness pal guy for many, many years. I had a streak of, I want to say 1,250 some days in a row well, of tracking way back in like 15, 16, 17. I hate it anymore just because the tracking app that I use now, which I'll get to here in a second, I can just put in the grams of how much food that I'm eating and boom, it tells me what my macros and my calories are. And unless my fitness pal has changed, you have to figure out the servings. So if I have... If something is a four ounce serving and I've got 156 grams, I have to figure out how many servings that is. And that drove me nuts. And for that reason, when I first got on the Fit Genie kick, I loved the fact that I could just put in 156 grams and they would figure it out for me. Right now, I just use the cheap little app that came with my, uh, my Fitbit, my little Fitbit Inspire too. Um, however, one caveat I will say is that because of the rounding of labels, the calories that come out of my spreadsheet that are based on the arithmetic of four calories per gram of carbohydrate and protein and, and nine calories per gram of fat, they don't match. The calories right. don't match. So that's why I kind of more so focus on calorie ranges, you know, um, and even with the rounding, as long as you're in your calorie range, I always end up getting the weight loss or the weight gain that I was after for the athlete and for myself, whether it was gaining, you know, or losing. So yeah, that's my rant on tracking apps. <laughs> yeah. a good one. That's a good one. What do you got? No, Brian? I, I agree with, with everything you said there. Um, yeah, I, I've messed around with macro factor. Yeah, I, I really like it as a tracking app. Um, I think it makes things very easy and you can believe enter grams like you had said, Brad, um, which is or was probably still is super annoying about my fitness pal. And it's the reason I never really used it for a sustained period. And it's funny. I don't know if you remember, Brad, um, it was like 2011, maybe. It was when, it was my first prep when I was working with Birdo. Um, Jason Lowy, he created My Macros Plus. And I don't I know if he was that. one of a, Do you? I my still Macros use it. Plus? Yeah. So I, I think at one point he had like in the 3DMJ HQ at the time on Facebook had like looked for people to test it out and I had volunteered and I love it. To, to this day, I still think it's for what it is, the, the easiest... Like it's not a coaching tool, really. I mean, I think it can be. I think there's an option to do that, like self-guided coaching based off of weigh-ins and stuff. But it does things down to the gram, like you said. They have Is a feature it? called like Fast Track where, like let's say I 
had a bag of, you know, chips or something and I wanted to log those or whatever, we'll say just, yeah, and I, it's not something I normally eat and I don't have it saved in my phone. You can just do what's called fast track where you just, you don't even have to write what it is. Just enter the macros that are on the label mm. yeah. and just add it to the day. And I use that a lot. Um, sometimes it's easier than just looking up the food, to be honest, if I'm eating the same amount as usual. Um, one thing I don't like about some of the like coaching elements within these apps is, and I don't want to speak on behalf of all of them, but it does seem like on average, a lot of them adjust things prematurely. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like you might have more sodium for four consecutive days than usual, but be within your caloric limits. And then all of a sudden your calories are reduced the next week. And so I think it can, psychologically, I think that can be hard for some people. Mm -hmm. It's like you're constantly getting things adjusted. And I think it makes, it can make the weight loss experience, if we're talking about weight loss here, like seem more complicated than it needs to be for some mm -hmm. people where it's okay, it's like pull back by this amount or, you know, pull back 12 grams of fat or, you know, whatever it is. So I, I, I love the tracking abilities of a lot of these apps with the exception of my fitness pal. Um, but I, I got to plug my macros plus it's, it's, yeah. it's a good nice. one. Um, and it's cheap too. There's it's, I think it's like four bucks in the app store. Um, and I think they have a barcode scanner that doesn't cost money. That's the other thing that sucks about my fitness pal. It's, does, doesn't that cost money now? The barcode I scanner? Don't know. I was on the free. I mean, I only bought it for like five or six years, but the whole time I was on I, free. I, I think within the past few my years, I, I want to say. Something, yes, yeah, something changed with my fitness pal that really caused a little <laughs> bit of an upstream with a lot I, of people. I think, it, I think the barcode scanner, you have to pay each month Ooh. to use it. And I, I don't think it's cheap. Um, yeah. So, yeah that type of stuff. But the, the nice thing about some of these other apps, like my macros plus is you don't have to worry about the rounding errors. Like they have a nutrition database that, um, you can use, but for most people, I just have them, you know, they're, they're consuming the same 20, 30 foods day in and day out. Yeah. It's like, just do the leg work up front, make sure it's accurate. And then you don't have to worry about these rounding issues that are giving you mm -hmm. headaches. Cause I'll get that question a lot. Like how come my fitness pal doesn't match what we have in the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Brad has so, a blog at 3dmusclejourney.com yeah. all about this. Do you on that? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. On that very subject. To, yeah. Why, why to that. your yeah. tracker doesn't match your. Yeah. And the, so, the, the ones that, the ones that deduct the fiber from the carbohydrate. Yeah. Uh, the that worst. will drive people <laughs> insane. And yours, yours and truly think, is fall victim to that. Yeah. And I think on my fitness pal too, you could, you could enter like just a random calorie amount and then enter macros that don't, don't even remotely match. Code, and it'll count the, it'll default to the calories rather than the macros. And so yeah. uh, it's, it's okay. the database there. I'm sure it's gotten a lot better, but it's like, you know, different yeah. entries for the same thing. And some people are just being blissfully ignorant. And I think when, okay. when they select them, it's like, which, which piece of pizza is the has best? the lowest yeah. amount yeah. of calories. Yeah. I'm going to take that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you want to avoid that. It also, in this question, particularly in terms of food nutrients, accuracy. So the one, and I haven't used this personally, okay. um, but I've heard chronometer is really good for that. Have you okay. heard, used that, Brad? Mm-mm. I've heard of it, but I've never used it. Yeah, heard I've heard it. it's it's great for like with the, anybody the, my, the micronutrient aspect of things. Was he? I'm not sure if they have an app or not. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, that, that was what I was going to suggest. Hmm. Okay. I will no, say I that for helpful. most of the apps, at least the, the, the common nutrients seem to be pretty darn accurate. Sodium. Um, mm -hmm. cholesterol, you know, things like that. Though the, it seems like the, most of those are pretty good. Um, yeah. and it's hard to mess those up. You At know, least on a according food to the labels. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But e either way, like for y'all's athletes, it goes in a spreadsheet that auto calculates calories. So y'all, mm -hmm. like the listener, if you're curious, like it's mm -hmm. not like, I know, Brad, you're probably, when you say like adjust your macro factor to one pound, like that's, I would imagine your off season, um, occasional check-in client not like like when you're prepping you guys have 
reporting via spreadsheet that you are in charge of the yeah for sure because uh, I'm I'm old and stubborn and so yeah while they will I will tell them to adjust their macro factor I still make them transpose and do all that data entry of their their macro no, entries into my stubborn. spreadsheet it's, uh, <laughs> it's it allows me to do my job the best yeah. I can yeah and, and across serve my clients athlete. yeah across yeah. clients then you have like the same I have uniformity right. I can right. make decisions easier that way and better yeah. decisions yeah yeah right. so that's especially all important in, too especially in something like prep where you can hit plateaus and weight loss a bit more frequently that might not be a result of being at maintenance intake, right. you know, there, it can just be a stress water retention yep. issue. Like, it can be a you, lot of things. Yeah. So, so one yeah. thing you want to like, and I don't know how many of these apps actually do this, but it's like, what all, if, if somebody hits a wall, it's like, okay, do we need to adjust? Like some of these apps may adjust because they didn't lose any weight or maybe they gained weight and they're going to adjust or, even And they're further. premature, like you said. Yeah. So I hate it, it when they they jump the gun. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I, in situations like that, like on the spreadsheet, I'll, I'll look at the rate of loss, like in the three, four weeks preceding that. Right. And if everything's right. been going smooth and then we just kind of seem to hit this abrupt wall, then assuming, you know, compliance has been there then there's really no reason to believe all of a sudden the deficit would just immediately Erased. shut the door on somebody, yeah. you know? So yeah. it's like, okay, well, let's, let's use the trends in the data. Let's play a game of chicken a little bit. And <laughs> eight times yeah. out of 10, I'd say you're, you're going to break through if you have information that kind of pushes you to that decision, um, you know, that supports that. So I think a lot of them adjust prematurely. And I think it, it's it's hard, it's a hard thing for an algorithm to capture when you're talking about something like prep specifically, when there can be so this many is not different. Not a normal body. Mm -hmm, like yeah. digestion, it's like okay, well, you know, they haven't shit in three you've days. You've been constipated no for five <laughs> yeah. days. Let's, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> guess what? Here's 500 less calories. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's, We're yeah. Just keep so it all in there. Yeah. And as, yeah. as practitioners, there's things that we can do that algorithms cannot do you know we're yeah. getting pictures every week and right. if 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 an athlete tells me that this dimple on my arm is getting deeper every single week how come i'm not losing weight well i don't know why you're not losing weight but you're getting leaner and that's the important yeah. thing and no we're not going to adjust yeah. you know yeah. mm -hmm. measurements every now and then i did a prep last year that was all measurements i mean the person didn't lose a pound for like the last five six weeks of prep but their measurements were getting smaller around their waist and around their thighs. And yeah, those are the kind of practitioner type things that we all have access to and knowledge of how to compare that algorithms cannot. And yeah. like you said, Brian, yeah, it, it was, <laughs> because, because you haven't dropped anything but like a quarter of a pound over the last five weeks here, let's just take away all these yeah. calories and over diet you. And then you lose more yeah. muscle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think they have a lot, those, those apps have a ton of utility for a lot of people. Um, but I think there's situations where prep yeah, being one not, of them, it, prep being one yeah. of them, where it's, there's probably a better, better approach. I yeah. Think. So it sounds like you'll have lots of options for tracking and maybe not so many good options for coachability in terms of the yeah, apps. I, like, I yeah, I would say that. It's, it's, it's going yeah. to it's gonna sound biased because we're a coaching company, but I also, I don't have Well, no, but y'all have explained why. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I've explained why, but I also, I haven't like done every single app that's out there, but I've, you know, I've, I've gotten feedback on a number of them and that, that does seem to be sort of a common theme. Right. Okay. So it depends, like everything. <laughs> like everything else. Next question. I've been thinking about the acts who, Wow. I've been thinking about the axial fatigue of deadlifts, squats, and standing overhead presses. These movements involve a lot more musculature, which can be problematic for those of us serious about training who go to the gym four to seven days per week. But wouldn't the fact that these exercises recruit more musculature make them more ideal for those who are only training one to three times per week? Question mark. You start us off, Brian? Yeah. Um... So I think that's that's a good point. I mean, those those movements, like we talked about earlier, are are going to be more subjectively fatiguing, at least. Um, 
and, you know, could limit our output. You know, anytime your spine is being loaded, you're, you're going to, there's going to be protective mechanisms in place there. So I think, yeah, it, it can definitely contribute to fatigue. And I think there's something to be said by dosing it strategically and kind of minimizing unnecessary fatigue cost with those movements when you're trying to build muscle. Um, so, you know, machines, it seems like people are starting to finally embrace that machines can be as good or more effective than some free weight movements. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, there's things, you know, with some machines that, you know, you might not be able to replicate. Like it's hard if you, if you only do hack squats or pendulum squats, like your back extensors aren't going to really get much work, you know, in comparison to like a back squat or, you know, and leg extensions or I'm sorry, leg curls prior can replace an RDL, you know, they definitely won't replace an RDL. So in that sense, I, I, I think we just have to be mindful in how much volume we allocate towards those. But to your, you know, the, the person that asked this question, to their point, they can actually be a very versatile tool for people that are training with less frequency. And so, you know, if you're training one to three times a week, you're probably, your, your total volume's likely going to be less than if you were training four to seven, probably should be anyway. Um, so with that, you know, there's more room for recovery. And so these movements, you're probably gonna be able to recover, have more resources available to recover from them. And, you know, you might not maximize hypertrophy in every muscle group if you're only doing, you know, these types of movements, but you're going to be hitting everything, you know, or more muscle groups, like you said, I shouldn't say everything, but yeah, like a, a bent over row, for example, you know, that it's probably not my first choice for like a rowing movement just because of the fatigue. I, it's not technically an axial loaded movement, but it's, it's one of those movements where, okay, if I'm not doing any hinging and I need something for my spinal erectors, like this is creating some overlap so I can get that without adding in a whole new movement. So I think some of the downsides of some movements can be upsides in other situations like that. And outside of that, I think, you know, just, you know, for, for people with a home gym, you're going to be a little bit more limited in most cases, but, uh, yeah, I, th I think it, you, you can run into fatigue issues if you're loading your spine every single day. Um, which is why I think they, they do have quite a bit of utility in lower frequency programs for hypertrophy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not a whole lot to add to that. Um, except, you know, to say that when you, we are coaching and, and, and helping people who only go to the gym one to three times a week, right. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of whole body training you know, for those one to three days a week, uh, just because you can axial load through overhead presses, deadlifts, um, squats on one of those days. And then all the rest of it can be, um, supporting those movements from previous days. And then you get the most, as far as frequency goes and your volume can be a teensy bit higher. Um, yeah, that's really the only thing that I could, I could tack onto that. And, and Brian took the words right out of my mouth there toward the end is that, you know, when you're training one to three times a week, you've got ample recovery, um, from the axial loading that comes from those movements, because that arguably is usually the, the, the stopping point when you're training five, six, seven days a week is that you have not got adequate time to recover from that loading and, week after week after week of, of doing that, you know, you can get away with it for five, six, seven weeks. But I think all of us have gotten to the point to where even with good, you know, proactive deloads and things like that, it just mounts and mm -hmm. you, you, you just comes to a, a screeching halt, you know, at some point. Um, but when you are training one to three times a week, I mean, you basically have four between four and six days of recovery from that. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that's why I'm a big advocate of, and I've done it myself, you know, getting kind of the best of both worlds and getting all of your cake and eat it too, um, 
when do your, you know, kind of whole body training in that, that one to three times a week type of an approach. Well, and there's also something to be said for like the arrangement, right? Because it's not like if you train four days a week, you could have two days where you're, for the listener, actually loading, putting weight on top of your bod, right? So mm-hmm. like you could have two days where you do it and two days where you're all machines Don't. or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Or Yeah. And that's how I would even approach it Anyways, if I'm training right? four to seven days a week. Yeah. 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 So exactly. it's not like uh, it's, uh, it's only it out a for bit. low frequency athletes. That's not what y'all are saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good distinction. Yeah. Like just because you do have access to gym time and lots of machines doesn't mean that you shouldn't do these That's things. That's a good point. Yeah. Especially if you're limited on time because there there is quite a bit of overlap with a lot of these mm-hmm. in terms of muscle groups. So supply and demand, like Jeff says. Okay. All right, guys. Last question. I'd love to hear more about how high day that's supposed to be low. I typed that wrong. Sorry about that. Okay. I'd love to hear more about how low and high day strategies work for non competitors. I'm experimenting with weekly targets. So 2,300 for six days and 3,000 on Saturdays. This seems to make me less miserable. Do you think this approach is pointless? Why do you think it works? Let's see. Do I kick this one off now? Did you do yeah, that, sure. Brian? Go ahead. Give it a kick. Um, I'm going to assume that this person is is trying to stay leanish. It sounds to me like they're kind of, at least they're being somewhat restrictive because I, I'm, and I'm reading between the lines here, it seems to make right. me less miserable. So clearly this Good person point. is not just eating, you know, kind of freely, right? They're, they're kind of that, that person that like, likes their body on the leaner side, even though their appetite would lend themselves to be a little bit less lean, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So uh, a little bit of reading between the lines here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I use high days for a lot of non-competitors that fall into that category, you know, um, people that do like to eat. And I mean, let's face it, especially here in the States, food is delicious, you know, and sometimes the more, the better. And that's not very conducive to meeting our, our physique goals if we're trying to keep, you know, leaner, leaner bodies. Um, so yeah, you know, having a, having a, a high day in there with, uh, the, the call it the mental permission of getting more calories in more tasty food, um, turns it into little mini sprints, you know, instead of this long marathon. And, um, that would be more so the reason that I would use it and would find it, um, quote unquote working, you know, kind of more so than anything is, as, 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 is compared to, you know, would it be effective for building muscle and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. While that is, that is true. You know, if you are, if you're eating at maintenance and you're somewhat restrictive because you're trying to stay lean, um, you could milk a little bit of quote unquote gains out of there, you know, by having a high day that puts you into a slight surplus that is almost not even measurable as far as the visual appearance of the, the physique, right? Um, but like I said, I would program that for, for this person just for the mental break, you know, kind of more so than, than any other reason why. Um, and then of course all that other stuff, it, 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 it does have its, um, its merits, you know, as well as you're always eating in, in, in maintenance or arguably maybe a, a slight deficit. Maybe we can get a little bit of gains out of having the overall weekly surplus bounce up a little bit because of one one high day, you know, that's kind of something I would have floating around in the back of my mind as I'm programming that for somebody without maybe actually verbalizing it to them. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, yeah, I I agree with everything he said there. Um, you know, I think they answered their own question. (laughs) It (laughs) makes them less miserable. Do I think it's pointless? No. Uh, it's going to be, you know, dependent on the situation. When I read this, I, like you, Brad, I, I sort of interpreted it as I made the assumption that the person is either trying to stay lean or more than likely dieting. Um, cause that's usually when, you know, it's certainly more common to have variable intakes when you're in a deficit than it is when like deliberately variable intakes when you're in a deficit versus a surplus. And I think for, for a lot of the non-competitors that I work with, I will give them the option 
of, of taking it just based on whether or not they want to. So I, it seems that the, it, it's entirely at this stage, unless someone's shredded, it, it's usually for psychological balance adherence purposes than, than anything. It's not for metabolic reasons. Um, and it doesn't seem like they do much for that anyway, maybe when people get peeled, but you know, or it, early in a fat loss phase or, you know, a mini cut, probably not necessary for that. So I, I think it's, it's helpful. I, I like to give people the option because some people will, they, I've had them email me and ask like, hey, can I skip the refeed? I've got good momentum. And it's almost like it, it feels like it's pulling them off track to some extent and they've got good momentum. And so two things there, one, I don't want to disrupt that momentum and I want to encourage that, especially if it's early on, but two, I also want them to be able to like not panic if they have, you know, be able to deviate, then get back on track. I think that's a skill worth developing. Um, but usually I'll, I'll give people, you know, okay, let's, let's aim for a certain range of, you know, rate of loss. And here's a refeed once a week. You know, if you want to take it, you can take it. If you take it, we're still going to be in a deficit. We're still going to be moving the needle. If you don't take it, it'll just be a little larger and you can take it next week if you want. So it doesn't need to be consistently, like even on the same day necessarily, I would just say, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, it's there to keep you adherent for a multiple weeks, months at a time. So you can reach the finish line. Um, and then, you know, with, with something like prep, I think what often doesn't get talked about enough, the utility of these is filling out so you can see how you look and mm. getting data for, for peaking, you know, yeah. okay. When do you, do you still look flat after your refeeds? You know, if you, if we're doing, sometimes we'll do three consecutive refeeds for somebody, you know, are, are they, when do they look their best in relation to those? And like Brad said, it's, it can kind of break up the week into sort of these sprints of fat loss. Like for me, I, during prep, I would rather have three days that are, that suck, that are pretty low, or let's say four days that are pretty low, and then four days at maintenance versus seven days with just a slightly higher intake. Like I would rather have those days where I'm just exiting the deficit. And right. then I know I only have like, I come off of those three days, I feel refreshed. My training is going well and, you know, I'm full. First day, I don't notice it. The second day, I might notice the deficit a little bit. And really, when I do it that way, only two of the seven days end up really feeling like dieting days. And so it's, I think, more of a psychological tool than, mm -hmm. than anything. But it also has utility for, for other reasons, especially during like a contest prep for, for non-competitors. I'd say primarily, you know, for sustainability of your efforts right. and just keeping, keeping the needle moving. Right. And, and to kind of piggyback too on Brian, on your, your multiple high day, or at least multiple maintenance day approach. Um, if, if we are interpreting this, 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 if we are reading between the lines correctly, if you have a pretty lean physique and you're, you're trying to, to maintain that through a little bit of, of restriction, um, sometimes it, 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 it is, it makes more sense to have a couple of days at maintenance because I mean, speaking just strictly from recent experience here, I had a high ish day here just recently. And after running 10, 11, 12 low days in a digging phase, I didn't even energy wise. I didn't even feel that high day. You know, it was mm -hmm. just like another day of dieting. The legs were still dead. Uh, I still did not want to walk to the car, you know. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I mean, it makes you hungrier too. <laughs> yeah, it's it like does. Throwing, it's if like you don't have like the follow-up days. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so, yeah, I mean, if this person is kind of trying to keep a, a, a pretty lean physique and performer in the gym, it's going to be worthwhile, in my opinion, to have a couple of high days in a row where, you know, maybe you're just at maintenance or just barely, you know, at a surplus. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's that we all know that that works, you know, you feel, like yeah. you said, Brian, you feel refreshed, that dead leg feeling is gone. And yeah. a lot of times you do end up looking better. Yeah. As a, y'all yeah. keep saying as a, I mean, in the question he's, he or she says they are a non-competitor. 
And then y'all have assumed through the context that they are trying to stay leaner or lose some. Um, do y'all think this is an effective strategy for just off-season maintenance? Or do y'all think it's a little bit pointless? Or Yeah, I think it still has a utility in the off-season. Um, the one thing I... If we're trying to control the rate of gain and we're looking at weekly averages, I think one thing that could potentially become an issue, like let's say somebody in their off season, I don't think many people would do this, but maybe they run maintenance six days a week and then they put all of their surplus on one of the days. You know, it's like they just have a day where they're, you know, going out to eat three times or whatever. I don't know. Seafood just, diet. It, it, if you it, see it, it you eat it. <laughs> an extreme example. But you, the degree of muscle gain from that is, I would wager, is going to be less, even though the rate of gain is going to be similar. Just because you're, like the stimulus, the increase in protein synthesis after training, you know, it's going to come back down. Like you want to provide the substrate surrounding that workout to really capitalize on it. And so... I try to get people to kind of spread their surplus out relatively evenly rather than having, you know, these large peaks and valleys. Um, and I think that to some degree, the same thing can be said for a deficit, you know, is, is it really more advantageous to have lower days and one high day or just all low days that are a little bit higher? I think it's just dependent on the individual. But, you know, I think for people who may have a tendency in the off season to, get a little too lenient um having days where it's it's almost like okay this is this is your day where you can let your hair down a little bit <laughs> and, yeah and, or like it's hard have to be a little bit social more. yeah it is when you're it in. is and you know i i like going out with you know to dinner friends and everything and, and it's uh yeah you, you kind of need to have that that wiggle room to have a social life i'd, I'd say yeah okay Brad, anything else about non-dieting, no, non-competitors I, I mean, with this swinging and high and low calorie days? Yeah, I mean, not really. I, I, okay. Other than it, 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 the only time that I kind of feel like a high day is is like pointless. It, it just depends on body composition, you know. Um, you know, your 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 typical physique that maybe is the resemblance of a a sumo wrestler, you know, where they've got a lot of muscle, but a lot of body fat. I don't see any point to having high days other than yeah. social gatherings. You know, uh, I don't think it's going to serve much of a purpose otherwise, because you're, you're never in an energy deficit anyway. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, and I so. think too, if the overall goal of an off season or a non-competitor, and like Steve says this a lot with his work, because he works with non-competitors is like, you, um, how do you want to live all the time, right? And so you're always training yourself, like, what's a what's a stable way to live? And if you, we track these things, like calories and things like that, like on, on paper for numbers in the way that this person is, till you have a handle on it and you don't need them, right? And, and then that's because you've gotten good at um, feeling hunger and fullness signals. And so I think think, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though when you're far enough away from needing to count in this way, you learn your body better and there are higher and low days naturally. So like if you did on the weekends, let your hair down a little, you'll probably find that you are less hungry Monday, Tuesday, and you don't even have to think about this because your body is always changing and reacting to what has been in it anyways. So if you're feeling a little hungry, then you just eat a little more. And if you're not in response to that or because it was a lower activity day, you also do that in accordance. And so then these things don't necessarily need to be planned. They just happen on your own because you've learned how to um, intuitively understand or feel what your body's kind of needing. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and even it even goes even a little bit deeper than that, you know, because I mean, I've been able to maintain a, a an arguably, um, probably leaner physique than my body would like without tracking at all and without any planning at all. You know, you yeah. go out to dinner and and or you know you go out to an event. Oh well, this this food is calorically much higher than what mm -hmm. I typically eat. 
I'm going to need to make sure that I eat, you know, some of that food, but not be as full mm-hmm. as I am when I'm having my food, you know, my prepared food that's not as calorically dense, you know. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it takes a little bit of thought, I guess, but I, I didn't do any planning. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, we went out to dinner mm-hmm. and yeah. had this. And, you know, I'd, I I left a little bit on the plate, you know, and took a doggy bag home, you know. <laughs> And then likewise, if I'm at home and I'm eating ultra clean because I'm a tightwad and I didn't go shopping and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eating all of the, uh, <laughs> the leftover vegetables and fruits, mm-hmm. I get to be fuller, you know, cause that's less calorically dense, you know? So yeah, yeah you're absolutely right, Andrew. You, 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 you adjust through non-numerical values, yeah. um, you know, and that's yeah. kind of what we want to do. That's eventually what we want to kind it's of good way, want to get good to. Good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, guys, crushed it. Y'all did so good. Everyone's learned so much. I'm so sure. Um, <laughs> and and thank, thank you, you to guys. the people that wrote in the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys for following us in places and asking us in places. And thank you, coaches, for your time. And we'll see y'all next time. Of course. Time thank you. On the 3DMJ yep. podcast. You.